Hey guys, in this month's Historical Fiction 101, I'm going to be sharing with you some recommendations for historical fiction through January through June of 2019. Okay, you guys, uh, this is a big one. Uh, sometimes I normally stick to around 10 to 20 books when I give these recommendations, but I went a little whack and I got 30 recommendations for books that are coming out between January and June of this year, 2019. Uh, so yeah, you guys, let's get going. I got my computer here because I decided, I'm not, I'm not I, was, I was like, I'm not taking no notes. I'm just going to read strictly from what's on the Goodreads synopsis for all these books. So yeah, uh, the first book, The Huntress by Kate Quinn. And uh, in the aftermath of war, the hunter becomes the hunted. Ooh. Bold, reckless Nina Markova grows up on the icy edge of Soviet Russia, dreaming of flight and fearing nothing. When the tide of war sweeps over her homeland, she gambles everything to join the infamous Night Witches, an all-female night bomber regiment wrecking havoc on Hitler's eastern front. Ooh, that sounds awesome. But when she is downed behind enemy lines and thrown across the path of a lethal, of a lethal Nazi murderess, known as the Huntress, Nina must use all her wits to survive. Okay, this sounds pretty freaking badass. You guys. Ooh. <laughs> okay, I definitely gotta get this. I definitely gotta get this. Next, At the Wolf's Table by Rosella Pastorino, uh, and it's translated by Lea Gen Genesco. So, uh, yeah, this sounds like it is some sort of translate. Maybe it, this is from Germany? I guess this is from Germany, perhaps? Uh, translated for English? Translated into English, I should say. So yeah, we are taking place in Germany, 1943. 26-year-old Rosa Sauer's parents are gone, and her husband Gregor is far away, fighting on the front lines of World War II. Impoverished and alone, she makes the fateful decision to leave a war-torn Berlin to live with her in-laws in the countryside, thinking she'll find refuge there. But one morning, the SS come to tell her she has been conscripted to be one of Hitler's tasters. Ooh. Three times a day, she and nine other women go to his secret headquarters, the Wolf's Lair, to eat his meals before he does. Forced to eat what might kill them, the tasters begin to divide into the fanatics, those loyal to Hitler, and the women like Rosa, who insist they aren't Nazis, even as they risk their lives every day for Hitler's. That, this sounds awesome. You guys, what's up with all the great books? Seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go broke this year. Seriously. How We Disappeared by Jing Jing Li. Let's see. This takes place in Singapore, 1942. As Japanese troops sweep down Malaysia and into Singapore, a village is ransacked, leaving only two survivors and one tiny child. In a neighboring village, 17-year-old Wang Di is bundled into the back of a troop carrier and shipped off to a Japanese military brothel, where she is forced into sexual slavery. After 60 years of silence, what she saw and experienced there still haunts her in the present. Ooh, ooh, seriously, another fantastic sounding book, you guys. Lovely War by Julie Berry. I tell you what, guys, there's a lot of World, World War I and World War II fiction in this list, I noticed. So yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, it's 1917, and World War I is at its zenith when Hazel and James first catch sight of each other at a London party. She's a shy and talented pianist. He's a newly minted soldier with dreams of becoming an architect. When they fall in love, it's immediate and deep, and cut short when James is shipped off to the killing fields. And then we have another character, it looks like. Aubrey Edwards is also headed towards the trenches. A gifted musician who's played Carnegie Hall, he's a member of the 15th New York Infantry, an all, an all African American regiment being sent to Europe to help end the Great War. Love is the last thing on his mind, but that's what, but that's before he meets Colette. A uh, Belgian, uh, Chanteuse? Chanteuse? You know, I'm not sure what that is. I'm gonna have to go look that up. Uh, and yeah, he has already, or no, she has already survived unspeakable tragedy at the hands of the Germans. Uh, so then, yeah, we, it looks like we have some sort of time jump. Thirty years after these four lovers' fates collide, the Greek goddess Aphrodite, what? 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 Aphrodite? What the hell? I, I feel like, I feel like this took a, a sharp dramatic twist, you guys, with the narrative. 
Okay, 30 years later, the goddess Aphrodite tells their stories to her husband, Hephaestus, and her lover Ares in a, in a Lux Manhattan hotel room at the height of World War II. She seeks to answer the age-old question, why are love and war eternally drawn to one another? Oh my goodness, seriously you guys? Okay, the first half of this book, the plot sounded pretty interesting, but then it looks like there's some sort of magical realism that's just kind of thrown out of nowhere. I'm not making this up. You gotta get on Goodreads to go read this, you guys. This is this sounds pretty weird, <laughs> but kind of interesting at the same time. Next, Tangled in Time, The Portal. And this is gonna be book one in a new series, uh, a middle grade series, it looks like. Uh, I really wanted to try to find at least a few middle grade and maybe young adult for this list, and I found a middle grade one. And yet, let's see, the plot of this one. Uh, life used to be great for Rose, full of friends, a loving mom, and a growing fashion blog. But when her mother dies in a car, car crash, Rose is sent away to live with a strange grandmother she hardly knows and forced to attend a new school where mean girls ridicule her at every turn. The only place Rose finds refuge is in her grandmother's greenhouse. But one night she sees a strange light glowing from within. She goes to investigate and finds herself transported back 500 years to Hatfield Palace, where she becomes a servant and confidant of the banished Princess Elizabeth, daughter of King Henry VIII. Rose soon discovers something else amazing, a locket with two mysterious images inside it, both clues to her own past. Could the greenhouse portal offer answers to the, to the mysteries of her family and their secrets? Ooh, uh, this sounds like a, a fantasy middle grade novel with historical fiction in it, time travel, kind of kind of a bit like Outlander, it sounds like. But instead of, uh, of Scottish highlands and rocks, it's, it's a greenhouse. That's a portal. Okay, <laughs> but that sounds kind of cool. Yeah, it sounds like this young girl's gonna be a young Elizabeth Tudor. The Binding by Bridget Collins. Uh, let's see, what is this about? Young Emmett Farmer is working in the fields when a strange letter arrives, summoning him away from his family. He is he is to begin an apprenticeship as a bookbinder, a vocation that arouses fear, superstition, and prejudice among their small community, but one neither he nor his parents can afford to refuse. For as long as he can recall, Emmett has been drawn to books, even though they are strictly forbidden. Bookbinding is a sacred calling. So it looks like he's apprenticing under this older woman. He learns to handcraft the elegant leather-bound volumes. Within each one, they will capture something unique and extraordinary, a memory. If there's something you want to forget, a binder can help. If there's something you need to erase, they can assist. Within the pages of the books they create, secrets are concealed and the past is locked away. In a vault under his mentor's workshop, rows upon rows of books are meticulously stored. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. A bit of a bit of fantasy thrown into your historical fiction, if you will. The Devil Aspect by Craig Russell. And let's see, this one. Taking place in Czech Czechoslovakia in 1935, we follow a young man, I get, is he a young man? I get, I'm assuming he's a young, a young man named Victor, a psychiatrist newly trained by Carl Jung, arrives at the infamous, uh, it's an asylum. I can't pronounce what this asylum is because it's probably a Czechoslovakian, but it's an asylum. That's all you need to know, you guys. That's important. Uh, for the criminally insane, the state-of-the-art facility is located in a medieval mountaintop castle outside of Prague, though the site is infamous for concealing dark secrets going back many generations. The asylum houses the country's six, the, the country's six most treacherous killers, known to the staff as the woodcutter, the clown, the glass collector, the vegetarian, the 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 so the so so macer seal macer, what's a seal? I'm not sure how that one's pronounced. And the demon, and Victor hopes to use a new medical technique to prove that these patients share a common archetype of evil, a phenomenon known as the devil's aspect. Ooh. As he begins to learn the stunning secrets of these patients, five men and one woman, uh, Victor must face the disturbing possibility that these six may share another dark truth. Ooh, this sounds pretty, pretty scary and creepy, but just serial killers and stuff, you guys. Ooh. Next, Woman 99 by Greer McAllister. 
Charlotte Smith's future is planned to the last detail, and so was her sister's, until Phoebe became a disruption. When their parents commit Phoebe to a notorious asylum, Charlotte knows there's more to the story than madness. Shedding her identity to become an anonymous inmate, Woman 99, Charlotte uncovers dangerous secrets. Insanity isn't the only reason her fellow inmates were put away, and those in power will do anything to keep the truth, or Charlotte, from getting out. Ooh, sounds pretty cool. Next, The Lost History of Dreams by Chris Waldhair. When famed Byron-esque poet Hugh de Boone is discovered dead of a heart attack in his bath one morning, his cousin Robert Highstead, a historian turned post-mortem photographer, is charged with a simple task, transport Hugh's remains for burial in a chapel. This chapel, a stained glass folly set on the moors of Shropshire, was built by de Bone 16 years earlier to house the remains of his beloved wife and muse, Ada. Since then, the chapel has been locked and abandoned, a pilgrimage site for the rabid fans of de Bone's last book, The History of Dreams. So yeah, it sounds like we have a mysterious book, a bit of a love story, yeah, some, some morbid craziness going on. Yeah, this one has a bit of a lengthy synopsis, so go check it out on Goodreads, but that sounds really good. Next, American Princess by Stephanie Marie Thornton. Uh, let's see, this is about Alice. Alice may be the president's daughter, but she's nobody's darling. As bold as her signature color, Alice Blue, the gum-chewing, cigarette-smoking, poker-playing first daughter discovers that the only way for a woman to stand out in Washington is to make waves oceans of them. With the canny sophistication of the savviest politician on the hill, Alice uses her celebrity to her advantage, testing the limits of her power and the seductive thrill of political entanglements. Okay, the daughter of, of Roosevelt. Okay, I'm about to say, it's sitting here mentioning like a president, but I was like, well, which president are they talking about? Okay, so, so, so Roosevelt, his daughter Alice. So that sounds pretty cool. Like, like it says, she 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 plays poker, she smokes. She sounds like she's a badass, you guys. Next, we got another book here involving a president. This one with George Washington. We have Dear George, Dear Mary, a novel of George Washington's first love. And I, I guess that's all I really need to say. I mean, there's not really much more synopsis other than the fact that this is about George Washington and his wife. Or no, not his wife. Uh, I guess the woman he first falls in love with. I guess the woman he first falls in love with. Uh, Mary. Does she have a last name? I'm trying to look on here and see if she has a last name. Mary Phillipses, I guess is her name, before he marries Martha. Next, The Lost Girls of Paris by Pam Genoff. We take place in Manhattan in 1946. Grace Hilly is rebuilding her life after losing her husband during the war. One morning while passing through Grand Central Terminal on her way to work, she finds an abandoned suitcase tucked beneath a bench. Unable to resist her own curiosity, Grace opens the suitcase where she discovers a dozen photographs, each of a different woman. In a moment of impulse, Grace takes the photographs and quickly leaves the station. Grace soon learns that the suitcase belonged to a woman named Eleanor Trigg, leader of a ring of female secret agents who were deployed out of London during the war. Twelve of these women were sent to occupy Europe as court as couriers and radio operators to aid the resistance, but they never returned home. Their fate a mystery. Setting out to learn the truth behind the women in the photographs, Grace finds herself drawn to a young mother turned agent named Marie, whose daring mission overseas, overseas reveals, a, re reveals a remarkable story of friendship, valor, and betrayal. All oh, this sounds like a beautiful story. Next, we have Lost Roses by Martha Hall Kelly. It is 1914, and the world has been on the brink of war so many times, many New Yorkers treat the subject with only passing interest. Eliza Faraday is thrilled to be traveling to St. Petersburg with Sophia, a cousin of the Romanovs. The two met years ago one summer in Paris and became close confidants. Now, Eliza embarks on the trip of a lifetime, home with Sophia to see the splendors of Russia. But when Austria declares war on Serbia and Russia's imperial dynasty begins to fall, Eliza escapes back to America while Sophia and her family flee to their estate outside the city. In need of domestic help, they hire the local 
local fortune teller's daughter, Varinka, unknowingly bringing intense danger into their home. On the other side of the Atlantic, Eliza, Eliza is doing her part to help the, the white Russian families find safety as they escape the revolution. But when Sophia's letters suddenly stop coming, she fears the worst for her best friend. See, this sounds pretty good and exciting. Next, Anna of Cleve, The Princess and the Portrait. Uh, this is book number four in the Six Tudor Queens series by Alison Weir. And yeah, not much more to say about this book. I mean, it follows uh, the fourth wife of King Henry VIII, uh, Anna of Cleve, or Anne of Cleves, uh, however you kind of want to call her. I tend to call her Anne of Cleves, uh, but yeah, Alison Weir is using Anna of Cleve. Uh, but yeah, she was the fourth wife of Henry VIII, uh, probably married to him for the least amount of time. I think their marriage was only like a couple months, you guys. I don't think it even lasted a year. But yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this. I love Alison Weir, and I, I, I've just really been enjoying her. She's Yeah, she's been doing a book for each of the wives of Henry VIII. Next, That Churchill Woman by Stephanie Barron. Wealthy, privileged, and fiercely independent New Yorker Jenny Jerome took Victorian England by storm when she landed on its shores. As Lady Randolph Churchill, she gave birth to a man who defined the 20th century, her son, Winston. But Jenny reared in, in the luxury of, of Gilded Age Newport and the Paris of the Second Empire, lived an outrageously modern life all her own, filled with controversy, controversy passion, tragedy, and triumph. Triumph. So yeah, uh, this sounds pretty cool. This, uh, for some reason, I thought this was going to be about Churchill's wife, but no, this is about Churchill's mother, which uh, I don't think I've ever heard anything about Churchill's mother, to be quite honest. So that yeah, that sounds really new and different. Next, The Chef's Secret by Crystal King. Sounds like this takes place in Renaissance Italy. Uh, when Bar when Bartolimo, Bar Bartolimo? I'm, I'm not Italian, you guys. I'm probably butchering that. When Bartolomeo Scapi dies in 1577, he leaves his vast estate, properties, money, and his position to his nephew and apprentice Giovanni. He also gives Giovanni the keys to two strong boxes and strict instructions to burn their contents. Despite Scapi's dire warning uh, that the information concealed in these boxes could put Giovanni's life and others at risk, Giovanni is compelled to learn his uncle's secrets. He undertakes the arduous task of decoding Scopi's journals and uncovers a history of deception, betrayal, and murder, all to protect an illicit love affair. Ooh. I do love uh, Renaissance Italy, you guys. This sounds pretty cool. Next, American Duchess, a novel of Consuelo Vanderbilt. I love the little thing up here at the top of Goodreads because it's refer it's referencing Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, you know, because Meghan Markle is American, and yet yeah, saying before Meghan Markle there was another American princess. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what this book is about. Uh, on a cold November day in 1895, a carriage approaches St. Thomas Episc Episcopal Church on New York City's Fifth Avenue. Massive crowds surge forward, awaiting their glimpse of heiress Consuelo Vanderbilt. Just 18, the beautiful bride has not only arrived late, but in tears. Yet her marriage to the aloof Duke of Marlborough proceeds. Bullied into the wedding by her indomitable mother, uh, Consuelo loves another. But a deal was made. Trading some of the vast Vanderbilt wealth for a title and prestige, Consuelo, bred to obey, realizes she must make the best of things. So this sounds, this sounds pretty exciting and kind of harrowing and maybe a little tragic, but yeah, following a strong independent woman, it sounds like. I've never heard of this woman, to be quite, quite honest. I've heard of the Vanderbilts, but I've never heard of Consuelo Vanderbilt. Next, uh, I think this book is pronounced and lies, and this is by David R. Gilham. And this is alternative history, you guys. Uh, questioning, or making the kind of what if statement, what if Anne Frank survived the Holocaust? As we know, Anne Frank, she died very tragically uh, at, was it Auschwitz? Did she, I think she died at Auschwitz if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the year is 1945 and Anne Frank is 16 years old. Having survived the concentration camps, but lost her mother and sister, she reunites with her father in newly liberated Amsterdam. But it's not as easy to fit the pieces of their life back together. 
Anne is adrift, haunted by the ghosts of the horrors they experienced, while her father is fixated on returning to normalcy. Her beloved diary has been lost, and her dreams of becoming a writer seem distant and pointless now. As Anne struggles to overcome the brutality of memory and build a new life for herself, she grapples, she grapples with heartache or with heartbreak, grief, and ultimately the freedom of forgiveness. A story of trauma and redemption. Uh, this this novel is honoring Anne Frank's legacy as not only a symbol of hope and perseverance, but also a complex young woman of great ambition and heart. Uh, yeah, this sounds interesting. It uh, it is alternate history about Anne Frank, if she had survived the Holocaust. Uh, yeah, I hope this is a, res a respect respectful book. You know what I mean? I hope it's respectful, that it's not just outrageous and out there. Uh, I am kind of curious if this is, is good. Next, The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. Mi Ja and Young Suk. I hope I'm pronouncing all that correctly. Uh, two girls living on the Korean island of Jeju? Jiju. I'm not Korean, you guys. I'm probably butchering this. Uh, it's about these two girls, you guys. Uh, they are best friends that come from very different backgrounds. When they are old enough, they begin working in the sea with their village's all-female diving collective led by Young Suk's mother. As the girls take up their positions as baby divers, they know they are beginning a life of excitement and responsibility, but also danger. Uh, yeah, it looks like this takes place during a period of Japanese colonialism in the 1930s and 1940s, followed by World War II, the Korean War, and its aftermath through the era of cell phones and wetsuits and women divers. This sounds kind of cool. This sounds really, really different. Next, The Summer Country by Lauren Willig. Love me some more. Uh, this takes place in 1854, starting in Bristol, England, and then to the Barbados Islands. Uh, we follow Emily Dawson. Uh, she has always been the poor cousin in a prosperous merchant clan, merely a vicar's daughter, and a reform-minded vicar's daughter at that. Everyone knows that the fam family's lucrative shipping business will go to her cousin, Adam, one day, but when her grandfather dies, Emily receives an unexpected inheritance, a sugar plantation in Barbados, a, planta a plantation her grandfather never told anyone he owned. So yeah, this takes her to Barbados. Uh, sounds very thrilling and exciting. Next, The Familiars by Stacy Halls. Young Fleetwood Shuttleworth. Fleetwood Shuttleworth. I, this sounds like this is a name from like Harry Potter or something, you guys. Young Fleetwood Shuttleworth, a noblewoman, is with child again. None of her previous pregnancies have borne fruit, and her husband, Richard, is anxious for an heir. Then, Fleetwood discovers a hidden doctor's letter that carries a dire prediction. She will not survive another birth. By chance, she meets a midwife named Alice Gray, who promises to help her deliver a healthy baby. But Alice soon stands accused of witchcraft. Oh, no. The plot twist. Is there more to Alice than meets the eye? Fleetwood must risk everything to prove her innocence. As the two women's lives become intertwined, the witch trials of 1612 loom. Time is running out. Both their lives are at stake. Only they know the truth. Only they can save each other. Ooh, sound, ooh that sounds good, you guys. Uh, besides the name of Fleetwood Shuttleworth, that's, that sounds very, very thrilling. Next, The Things We Cannot Say by Kelly Reimer. Reimer? Something like that? This is another World War II book. Uh, it takes place in Europe in 1942. Uh, something about a Russian refugee a, a Russian refugee camp. Uh, since she was nine years old, Alina knew she would marry her best friend Tomas. Now 15 and engaged, Alina is is unconcerned by by, by reports of Nazi soldiers at the Polish border, believing her neighbors that they pose no real threat, and dreams instead of the day Tomas returns from college and Warsaw so they can be married. But little by little, injustice by brutal injustice, the Nazi occupation takes hold, and Alina's tiny royal, 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 rural, rural, I got it, you guys, rural village, its families are divided by fear and hate. Then, as the fabric of their lives is slowly picked apart, Tomas disappears. Oh no. When Alina used to. 
where Alina used to measure time between visits from her beloved, now she measures the spaces between hope and despair, waiting for word from, t from Tomaz and avoiding the attentions of the soldiers who patrol her parents' farm. But for now, even deafening silence is preferable to grief. Oh, dear. Next, The Witches of St. Petersburg by Imogen Edward Jones. Uh, as daughters of the impoverished king of Montenegro, Melitza and Stana must fulfill their duty to their father and leave their beloved home for St. Petersburg to be married into senior positions in the Romanov court. For their new alliances to the Russian nobility will help secure the future of the sisters' native country. Immediately, Melitza and Stana feel like outcasts as the aristocracy shuns them for their provincial ways and for dabbling in the occult. Undeterred, the sisters become resolved to make their mark by falling in with the lonely, depressed Tsarina Alexandra, who, as an Anglo-German, is also an outsider and is not fully accepted by members of the court. After numerous failed attempts to precipitate the birth of a son and heir, the Tsarina is desperate and decides to place her, decides to place her faith in the sisters' expertise with black magic. Wow. Awesome. Next, The Night's Tiger by Yangzi Chu. Uh, I have previously read a book by Yangzi Chu. I loved it. I definitely got to get my hands on this. Quick witted, ambitious uh, Ji Lin is stuck as an apprentice dressmaker, moonlighting as a dance hall girl to help pay off her mother's mahjong debts. Oh my goodness. But when one of her dance partners accidentally leaves behind a gruesome souvenir, I wonder, what, oh man, what is it? I'm already curious. Uh, Ji Lin plunges into a dark adventure, a mirror world of secrets and superstitions. 11-year-old Chinese houseboy Rin also has a secret, a promise he must fulfill to his dead master to find his master's severed finger and bury it with his body. Rin has 49 days to do so, or his master's soul will wander the earth forever. Okay, I'm already intrigued, you guys. This is awesome. So I'm wondering if that's what it is, the gruesome souvenir that this, this, this young girl receives. I bet it's the finger of this, of this master, that this, this 11 year boy, you know, the finger, he's looking for this guy's finger. I bet that's what the gruesome souvenir is. <laughs> this sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm definitely getting this. Next, A Dangerous Collaboration uh, by Deanna Rayborn. And this is book four in the Veronica Speedwell series. I've only read the first book in this series, you guys. I'm, I'm desperately far behind. Uh, I, I really want to catch up. Uh, I don't think I'm going to sit and say too much about this book since it is book four in a series. Uh, but yeah, what, all you need to know is that it takes place in Victorian London following uh, a young woman named Veronica Speedwell and uh, this, this guy named Stoker. Uh, that's kind of all I'm going to give you guys. Like I said, it's book four. Don't want to spoil anything for you. Next, To Keep the Sun Alive by Rabia Ghaffari. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The year is 1979, the Islamic Revolution is just around the corner, as is a massive solar eclipse. In this epic novel set in the small Iranian city of Nishapur, a retired judge and his wife, Bibi, grow apples, plums, peaches, and sour cherries, as well as manage several generations of family members. The days here are marked by long, elaborate lunches on the terrace and arguments about the corrupt monarchy in Iran and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. And yet, life in the orchard continues. Uh, an uncle develops into a powerful cleric. A young nephew goes into university, hoping to lead the fight for a new Iran and marry his childhood sweetheart. An elder nephew surrenders to opium, uh oh, while his widowed father dreams of a life in the West. Uh, this sounds pretty cool, you guys. Uh, it does play, It does take place in 1979. Uh, I I don't. I've said this before in the past. I don't really consider the 80s to be historical fiction yet. But a lot of lists, if something does take place in the in the 80s, a lot of lists have been including it. And yeah, that kind of includes the 70s because this is late. It's 1979. Uh, so I'm going to include it on this list, even though I do. I have such a hard time considering the 70s and the 80s historical fiction, you guys. But I'm going to put this in the list. Next, The Woman in the Lake by Nicola Cornick. It looks like this has a dual time period because it looks like some of it takes place in the modern era and then but some of it takes place in London, 1765, which is the part I'm going to tell you guys about. Uh, Lady Isabella Gerard, a respectable member of Georgian society, orders her maid to take her new golden gown and destroy it. Why? It's shimmering beauty tainted by the actions of her brutal husband the night before. Oh, okay, that makes sense now. Three months later, Lord Ger Lord Gerard, sorry, 
stands at the shoreline of the lake, looking down at a woman wearing the golden gown. Uh oh. As the body slowly rolls over to reveal her face, it's clear this was not his intended victim. Uh oh. Oh oh dear, this this sounds thrilling. Yeah guys. So then yeah, it, then then it says two hundred and fifty years later. Uh, when a gown she stole from a historic home as a child is mysteriously returned to Fenella Brightwell, it begins to possess her in exactly the same way that it did as a girl. Soon, the fragile new life Finn has created for herself away from her abusive ex-husband is threatened at its foundations by the gown's power over her until she can tell, before she can't tell what is real and what is imaginary. As Finn uncovers more about the gown and Isabella's story, uh, she begins to see the parallels with her own life. When each piece of history is revealed, the, gr the gown and its past seems to possess her more and more, culminating in dramatic revelation set to destroy her sanity. Ooh, this sounds like a interesting thriller or mystery. Something about a gown? Is this gown possessed or something? It's killing all sorts of people. Next, The Last Days of the Romanoff Dancers by Carrie Turner. Let's see, we take place in Petrograd, 1914. Valentina Yershova's position in the Romanov Imperial Russian Ballet is the only thing that keeps her from the clutches of poverty. With implacable determination, she has clawed her way through the ranks to soloist, utilizing not only her talent but, but her alliances with influential rich men that grants them her body but never her heart. When Luca, the gifted son of a factory worker, joins her company, her passion for ballet and love is rekindled, putting at risk everything that she has built. For Luca, being accepted into the company fulfills a, a lifelong dream, but in the eyes of his proletariat father, it makes him a traitor. As war tightens its grip and the country starves, Luca is increasingly burn, burdened with guilt about their lavish lifestyles. While Luca and Valentina's secret connection grows, the country rockets toward revolution that will, that will decide the fate of every dancer. For the Imperial Russian Ballet has become the ultimate symbol of Romanov indulgence, and soon the lovers are forced to choose their country, their art, or each other. Oh, this sounds awesome. You guys, this sounds awesome. Next, The Wolf and the Watchman. This is actually a book that was initially released back in 2017, it says here on Goodreads, but I guess it's just now being released here in America. It is 1973, four years after the storming of the Bastille in France and more than a year after the death of King Gustav III of Sweden, paranoia and whispered conspiracies are Stockholm's daily bread. A promise of violence crackles in the air as ordinary citizens feel increasingly vulnerable to the whims of those in power. When Michael, a crippled ex-soldier and former night watchman, finds a mutilated body floating in the city's malodorous lake, he feels compelled to give the unidentifiable man a proper burial. And then, yeah, something about a, a lawyer. Uh, for, I, I don't know, this, this is kind of crazy, guys. I'm trying to read this plot synopsis all over the place. For Cecil Winge, a brilliant lawyer turned consulting detective to the Stockholm police, a body with no arms, legs, or eyes is a formidable puzzle, and one last chance to set things right before he loses his battle to consumption. Oh, this is tragic. Together, Winge and Cardell, or Michael, I should say, uh, Winge and Michael scour Stockholm to discover the body's identity, encountering the, sor the sordid underbelly of the city's elite. Yeah, this, this sounds really good. Cool. It's comparing this book to something like uh, The Alienist, it says up here at the very top. And I do love The Alienist, so I definitely, I gotta, I gotta check this, this out. Did I ever give the, the author name, you guys? I said this was the night, I said this was The Wolf and the Watchman, I didn't give you the author. The author is Nicholas Nott-Okadog. That's my best uh, pronunciation there, you guys. Okay, you guys, the very last book I have here, finally, I'm at the end. The Bird King by G. Willow Wilson. Let's see. Uh, this novel tells the story of Fatima, a concubine in the royal court of Granada, the last emirate of Muslim Spain, and her dearest friend, Hassan, the palace mapmaker. Hassan has a secret. He can draw maps of places he's never seen and bend the shape of reality. When representatives of the newly formed Spanish monarchy arrive to negotiate the Sultan's surrender, Fatima befriends one of the women, not realizing that she will see Hassan's gift as sorcery and a threat to Christian Spanish rule. With their freedoms at stake, what will Fatima risk 
to save Hassan and escape the palace walls. As Fatima and Hassan traverse Spain with the help of a clever jinn, a genie, I guess, to find safety, uh, the Bird King asks us to consider what love is and the price of freedom at a time when the West and the Muslim world were not yet separate. Ooh, this sounds pretty cool. So there you have it guys, 30 books. This is probably a really long video, but yeah, there were so many great books I wanted to share with you guys. So in the comments below, have you guys heard of any of these books? Do you want to read them? Are there any books coming out from, you know, January, between January through June this year that you think I should check out? Just let me know. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye guys.